Okay, hello everybody. Um, Mary's going to talk over you having lunch, um, but you're up for something special here. Um, Barry, with his wife, directs Lord Cultural Resources um, and has had an extraordinary career spanning 40 plus years through the arts. Um, and I think uh, well, I'm not going to go through his bio because actually I want to hand the floor over to Barry to actually explain and to talk about what he wants to talk today. But I think over that 40 years, one of the big interventions he's had is to work with museums globally and to reposition and to rethink how those museums can work within communities, but also internally within their own our practice. He is probably what I think in over the 40 years, he, he kind of maps cultural change. And I think what he's going to talk, well, what he's going to talk about now is actually a next stage, a next vision of, of how we view our culture and how it is changing from outside forces and how important that is. So I'm going to hand over to Barry now um, and let him have the floor and let him have the explanation. And please, this is a really interesting talk and a really futuristic thinking about the way our culture is and how it is going to be in the very near future. Thank you. Barry. Thanks very much, uh, David. And um, David, of course, uh, as I'm sure most of you know, uh, is with Cape Farewell, which is a most uh, most exciting uh, organization uh, for us because it really is very much a part of the culture of stewardship, which is what I'm what, one of the things I'm going to be talking about today. Uh, delighted to uh, share your uh, share your lunch uh, with you, um, and uh, I. Uh, was happy to be invited here because uh, it gives me an opportunity to uh, try out with you uh, some ideas that are going into my next book, which is called Art and Energy. And uh, it'll be published by the AAM Press, which is the American Alliance of Museums Press, uh, in uh, May. And um, uh, uh, we, the Ideas of it, I think, are very relevant to this conference here. In fact, this conference itself is a fine example of the culture of stewardship in, uh, in uh, operation. Now, uh, the book itself is about the entire history uh, of, uh, of energy sources and their relationship with art and culture. Uh, so it starts with the mastery of fire, uh, and of course, the beginnings of performing art with the uh, with the, uh, song and story uh, and dance uh, and costume uh, around around the fire uh, around the hearth. That is the culture of the hearth, which was the culture that fire brought with it. Uh, and it goes through all of the ancient uh, ancient civilizations, the importance of slavery as a source of energy is one of the important things in the book. Um, it's very important to understand the energy of slaves, as Leonard Cohen called it, the energy of slaves as an energy source, as, as one of the sources of, of energy. Um, the entire uh, history uh, covers, therefore, a very wide spectrum. I'm not going to talk about that today, but rather focus on the present situation and the recent history of the last several hundred years uh, is really uh, the focus here today uh, because uh, we do want to focus on, of course, the performing arts and uh, the, uh, what, it, what, what, what is the situation uh, right now. Uh, the history that we're making uh, today is, is an important part of, uh, of what we need to talk about. So when we start talking about performing arts uh, today, I find it, we need to start with the audience and always in talking to the audience, um, uh, about the audience, um, nowadays everybody marvels at the remarkable change in communications that has led to a whole different character of cultural access uh, to what we formerly had. Uh, books, of course, have uh, become e-books, uh, music uh, moving through LPs and CDs, uh, but now, of course, accessible on the net. 
I have a son who leads a, leads a rock group here in Toronto, and he tells me you, he literally can't give away CDs now. Uh, people don't know what to do with them. Uh, he has them stacked up, but, but people are very enthusiastic about his music. They want to know how they can get on the, get on the net and, uh, and, and, and get some of his music, but the, a CD, they just don't know what to do with it. It's, there actually are young people like that who are, are not able to recognize them. So that, of course, has been a tremendous change. And uh, right now, of course, um, uh, with uh, VCRs and DVDs uh, uh, having given way to HBO and Netflix, we have uh, a, a whole different relationship of how, <clears throat> how people um, uh, are actually accessing um, uh, film presentation. <clears throat> so my hometown is Hamilton. So of course I I uh, start with the question of what's showing in Hamilton tonight. Uh, I live in Toronto now, but uh, uh, I, in 1953, uh, when I was in Hamilton uh, as as uh, as a youngster, uh, there were 23 movie theaters uh, and three drive-ins. So there were 26 uh, movies you could see uh, in that uh, on in any one night in Hamilton. And there were about 300 and something over 300,000 people. If we say there were 312,000, 26 divides nicely, and we are looking at one movie available per 12,000 people. Uh, and today, of course, uh, there are at least, I'm sure there are actual statistics of the numbers of, of films that you could access tonight between HBO and Netflix uh, and, and, of course, the few DVD stores there are, <clears throat> like one downtown Toronto that really has some excellent DVDs that are still worth going after. But between all of those things, you could access at least 12,000 films. So the whole relationship has changed totally uh, from what it was in, uh, in just 50 or 60 years ago. And another significant factor is that in 1953, those 26 theaters in Hamilton were actually, all of them, controlled by, in terms of the films that they were showing, the, those decisions were being made by a couple of distributors in St. Louis. As a matter of fact, they were deciding what theater, what films were available to those uh, those uh, cinemas uh, uh, in, in the whole of Canada. And uh, today, of course, the access to those 12,000 plus films that you could pick from tonight uh, through those various means, uh, that access is, is very, very much wider. Of course, there still are controls, but nevertheless, you've got a huge uh, range and variety of, uh, of films that you can, uh, you can uh, access. So, sorry. I'm getting it. it was a problem reading the document. Why is that? Hello, can I get some tech help here? <laughs> Should it run? Let's switch to the next one. So I'm doing this, right? No. Oh. So that's what happens. Okay. That's the problem. There must be an error in the email. Oh, God. Um, okay, stand by. If you just like to continue hmm? asking your questions, I've got to go figure something out. I'll be back. Okay. Okay. All right. Well, we're <laughs> we uh, we have a little uh, discussion before any 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 further. Um, what I'm coming to is that the. Um, the, this relationship has changed totally, and we have the, the old category of what we used to call couch potatoes are actually now able to become connoisseurs. They're actually being pushed to become connoisseurs. Uh, Netflix demands that you evaluate, right? Uh, but in, on all the media now, we get you know demands as to you express your likes, your dislikes, and give reasons for them. And of course, then you read everybody else's uh, rationale for their their evaluation. So suddenly, uh, just in the last five ten years, we have a tremendous advance in terms of people actually exercising critical discrimination about the uh, about the images that they're that they're seeing. Um, I could probably, could give it on, all right, we're, we have some hope, I gather. Um, 
the, the um, point that I'm coming to here is that um, this is all fine in terms of the communications revolution, and many people discuss these issues entirely as a question of communications. In, in our practice with Lord Cultural Resources, you know, we do planning of, of theaters and museums and uh, other cultural centers. In our practice, uh, we find that whenever you see something as a communications uh, issue or a communications problem or even a communications achievement, communications revolution, you really haven't dug deep enough that there's something else there. And um, in our... Um, in our previous, uh, the previous book we did on these kinds of subjects, which was Artists, Patrons, and the Public, Why Culture Changes, we're asking the basic question, why should culture change at all? And, and how does the change come about? Where does the change come from? And the, one of the chapters of that book led me to the thesis of this one, which is that all, all of our cultures are dependent. Thank you, that's a lovely shot from... Uh, that's from The Seagull, uh, the National Film Board production of The Seagull. Uh, gorgeous image. Um, so the, the fundamental thesis of the book is that, all, as we know, all life depends on energy. All culture, therefore, depends on energy. Uh, and when we say depends on, that puts us in a relationship of dependence uh, with always with some energy source, beginning with the mastery of fire. All of human civilization from the mastery of fire forward has depended on some source of energy other than the, our simple sexual energy and kinetic energy that we have as, uh, as individuals. So this is the question I was asking. Is this just a communications revolution or is something more involved? What does the revolution, what does that communications revolution depend on? Uh, we think really this, the, the fundamental relationship of all of our cultures to energy, uh, to the energy that makes them possible, has not been sufficiently explored. And when you start exploring it, you come to realize that the so-called energy debate is really a cultural debate. That really what we're talking about in, in, in energy questions is really a cultural question. All life depends on energy, all culture, all communication. So the key question is what is the source of energy and what cultural values does each source of energy bring with it? Each source of energy requires certain attitudes, values uh, with, that we have to emphasize, others that we have to de-emphasize or suppress, and so it has been through the entire history of human civilization. Right now, we talk about energy. We're very often... Sorry, we've got to... Can I get rid of that? Without, uh... I don't know how I can, thanks. Um, right now, usually we talk about energy. People think immediately of electricity. Uh, and of course, uh, the importance of electrification is, uh, is critical, especially for the 20th century. Thank you. Um, so uh, there, there are five stages of electrification that, uh, that uh, I, I go through in the book. Uh, beginning, of course, with uh, Edison, 1879, perfecting the electric light bulb, which changes night into day in a much more radical and definitive way than the gas lamps had done previously. So we get a, we get a whole uh, uh, capacity to change, which is what electrification keeps telling us uh, throughout the 20th century. Factory, uh, the applications to the factory, getting rid of all those, all those belts and so on. Instead, you're just pressing buttons. Uh, application to the office, of course, and the domestic appliances, changing the role of women especially, uh, and the whole nature of work. Um, then, of course, the effect on uh, performing arts uh, with cinema, recordings, radio, TV, uh, uh, and, and uh, the fourth stage, of course, air conditioning, um, which is another radical uh, message that we can change the climate. We can actually change the climate uh, incredibly. Uh, and finally, of course, digitization, which is the, the, the uh, electrification uh, stage that we're living in today uh, and have been for the last 30, 30 40 years. Now, uh, 
digitization is particularly interesting because it really belongs, uh, and in, in the book I've been wrestling with this because you have to put something in one chapter or another, it really belongs not in the history of electrification, but actually in the, uh, in the development of the culture of stewardship uh, as it comes along. And I'll, I'll come to that a bit later, but, it's, uh, but of course, viewed from the point of view of electrification, it really tells us we can change practically everything. And it has, in fact, changed so many aspects of, of what we know, how we know it, how we talk to each other, how we meet each other. Our whole social existence has been so transformed by uh, digitization. Um, the culture that came with electrification was a culture of transformation. Electrification gave us confidence through all those five stages and kept renewing that confidence that we can change the world. So this is the answer to a question that I've always thought was most important and never really got to grips with until I looked at it through the energy lens, which is that in the 20th century, for the first time in history, millions and millions of people believe that it's possible to change the world. And even artists believe that it's possible to change the world through art and architecture, Corbusier, the Bauhaus, uh, international modernism believes that you can change the world through art. How many people here believe that still? Right? I do, sure. <laughs> do we still have that confidence is a major question. And of course, the, the, the reason why it's a major question is we have had a number of other energy uh, changes, energy transitions that have brought th their values with them on which we are heavily dependent. And when we're heavily dependent on an energy source, it means we are buying into that group of, uh, of cultural values that come with it. Now, elect electricity, of course, is not really a source, of a source of energy in itself, as you know. Hydroelectric power uh, at Niagara was, of course, where we first got acquainted with it, but very, very early it was found that coal-fired plants and oil or gas-fired power plants uh, could do it, and then ultimately nuclear energy, of course, applied to it, and now we have the opportunity to generate electricity through uh, renewable energy. So elect electrification as such, having had such a tremendous effect in stimulating modernism uh, and the culture of transformation, uh, in the 20th century, uh, uh, the electrification itself uh, lends itself to, of course, also transmitting the values of all of those uh, other energy sources, the values that come with them. Really most enlightening is to understand that energy sources are not value neutral. Every energy source forces on us certain values uh, and, and, uh, and on the other hand suppresses others. So electrification brought the culture of transformation, but um, uh, we are, when we depend on sources of energy, our culture then depends on those values. This is not deterministic because what it is is that artists respond to the values that are incoming. It's happening right now, and it's happening right here, as a matter of fact, with the values that come from renewable energy. Renewable energy is currently the incipient incoming new culture uh, against the culture that came with oil and gas, which is the culture of consumption. Uh, and right now we have cutting edge artists who are responding. That's really what I'm gonna talk about for the rest of this presentation is the way in which artists are responding to uh, the, uh, the cultures, the values that are incoming now with um, renewable energy. Still very much contested still avant-garde, still uh, not, not by any means received or, or generally uh, acknowledged because renewable energy is not yet uh, by any means uh, a, a dominant source on which we can be uh, reliant. So this is the, this is the mix uh, overall today. We have uh, inherited a number of these uh, cultures uh, with the energy sources that came with them. And what's really fascinating uh, as I've done the job historically, and as I say, beginning with the ancient sources of energy, you know, which include, as I say, slavery, animal power, water power, um, there's a whole historical range. What's interesting is that every set of values, every culture that comes with each energy source stays with us. It's still there as long as we're, to some extent, still using that energy source. So it's a, you know, it's, it, it doesn't go away, uh, it's, it's still there. It's exactly like uh, old, master, old masters in, in the arts. 
and, and, and compared with cutting edge, cutting edge new art, all those things are still uh, coexisting. So um, electrification, the culture of transformation. Coal, of course, the culture of production with the work ethic, with the, with the insistence that production is everything. When you hear a, uh, a uh, senator in, uh, in the US Senate denying climate change, it's because he's come out of the culture of production. The culture of production said, production is what matters. Please get out of the way if you're standing in the way of production. That's really what matters, right? The work ethic teaches us that, and uh, the social class consciousness that comes with it means that those, those who are uh, either in, in production in the, in, in the, among the, the working class or those who are responsible for the generation of capital and so on through production, both sides are equally committed to getting production done. And that's, what, that's what's really valuable. That's why I say the energy debate is really a cultural debate. It's really a, a, a conflict between people with different cultures. What's very seldom recognized is that oil and gas have a totally different culture from the culture of production. The culture of consumption that came, comes with oil and gas, this is actually where I discovered the theme of the, of the book because we have done a lot of work in Saudi Arabia and in the Emirates in, uh, in, in, the, Arab, uh, in the Gulf states. Um, and when you're there, you're really struck, first of all, superficially, when you first go there, aside from the, you know, there, obviously there are cultural differences, the role of women and all that sort of thing that are quite well known. But when you're actually working there, working with the people, uh, what's striking is that the actual culture of Saudi Arabia today is centered around the mall. Shopping is the major social activity. It's a major place that people can meet one another and be together and so on. Of course, the mosque is, the mosque is something else, but aside from the religious focus, the actual life, social life of the people, cultural life of the people is really in the malls. That's, the, that's where the, the cultural activity happens. Remember, there are no theaters, there are no cinemas. Uh, the, uh, the actual social get-together place is the mall. So uh, that, of course, was not the way 60 or 70 years ago you had a very, very different civilization, very different culture before the effect of oil and gas made its effect felt. Oil and gas does not depend, as coal does, on organizing huge numbers of men and getting them down underground uh, and, and getting the production out of them in order to make the steam that made the railways possible and so on. All that production-centered life that Karl Marx, of course, wrote about uh, with coal, uh, in fact, one sees that what Marx was talking about when he said that everybody is defining themselves in relation to the struggle for production, that is coming out of the culture of production. With oil and gas, none of that is very, very important. Once you've, it's primarily a knowledge industry, you have to know your geology, your engineering, once you've got the pipes down and you've got the, you've got the stuff flowing, as long as you can protect that pipeline, it's, you're really interested in how many barrels shall we ship today and what's the price? You're interested in the consumption end. The nexus of value shifts from the production to the consumption end. So with oil and gas, we get the culture of consumption and that's what you see in Saudi Arabia or the, or the Emirates, a culture really focused on consumption as such. Um, and to some extent, you can see it in the difference between, say, Texas and the rest of the United States, or between Alberta and the rest of Canada, not to, not to make too big a point of it, but there certainly is a difference in, in the importance given to consumption for its own sake. So that's the culture that we are dependent on today. We are dependent on oil and gas. We, could, we would not be here, this would not be happening without, uh, without uh, oil and gas, and that is our dependence. Many people deplore that dependence uh, as if it was, you know, as if we could somehow get independent. Well, we can't get independent. We will always be dependent on whatever our energy source is. Renewable energy is, of course, the, the, uh, the hope of the future in terms of the culture of stewardship. But we've had now, <clears throat> since the Industrial Revolution, uh, we've had three uh, centuries of con continual recurring energy transition. 
And with each energy transition, there comes a new way of looking at people. So in the culture of consumption, class consciousness is really diminished. So from the point of view of, uh, of, of labor organizers or, or, or communists, it's really very difficult to sustain class consciousness. Look what happened in the Soviet Union in the 60s. It was in the mid-60s, A, that oil and gas overcame coal as the major energy source globally in the world. That starts in 64. And in the mid-60s, in the Soviet Union, I, I know because I lived through this, we first started to hear that young people in the Soviet Union were for the first time, and after all, this, all the incredible sacrifice of the war and the travails of the, of the 50s and so on, the Stalin revelations, what have you, nevertheless, class consciousness remained strong right through until the early 60s. But by the mid-60s, we start to hear that Soviet young people are really keen about, about uh, Levi's and rock and roll. I have a close friend, Stuart Samuels, uh, a film producer who uh, went in the mid-60s, 65, he went to the, the Soviet Union and paid for his trip by taking Levi's with him. And, uh, and he said the main thing was he had to leave the labels on. Branding is an important part of the culture of consumption, right? Along with the culture of consumption comes one of the greatest revolutions, social revolutions of of the 20th century that is seldom seen as the revolution it is, which is universal credit. My grandparents, if they wanted to buy a washing machine, they saved their money, and when they had enough money, they bought a washing machine. Nobody does that today because of universal credit. Henry Ford started selling cars on, selling cars on time. That's the oil and gas culture, right? And Credit cards started as gasoline cards. The first ones were used in, uh, in uh, uh, petrol stations, as the British say, gas stations, we would say. The, those were the first cards that you could, uh, you could buy uh, with plastic. And of course, the credit card companies then saw that they would be good for everything. Uh, initially, you used to carry a lot of cards. I remember having you know, cards for different stores, different department stores all had different ones. Okay, so. The universalization of credit is absolutely critical so that we can all participate in the culture of consumption, which sees everybody as consumers. That's why we don't have the social class consciousness that we had in the, uh, in the, in the coal area, the culture of production. What we have now is a, is a perception of each other as consumers. What do we have in common? We're all consumers. Yeah? In, from the point of view of the culture of consumption that comes with oil and gas, that is really essentially what it's about. Now, each one of the changes that have come, beginning with the Industrial Revolution, which is, of course, an incredible wrenching change in, in initially in Western Europe and then in America, an incredible wrenching change eventually all around the world, the, the Industrial Revolution set about of changing people's relationships. What does it mean to be a man? What does it mean to be a woman? gets changed totally by these, when we talk about these cultural value changes. Same thing with the, with the culture of consumption coming in, right? And of course, the culture of transformation gives you the, the, the ambition, the aspiration to be able to change the world. So it's tremendously upsetting. It leads to a lot of, a lot of strife and anxiety. So from especially from about the beginning of the 20th century, we have a culture of anxiety, which I'm really convinced comes out of the intergenerational conflicts that arise because of the constant change of, of energy sources, which bring with them these conflicting values, and particularly younger generations then respond like cutting-edge artists, they respond to the new values, and it's going on right today, by the way, in, in uh, discussions between, in families, uh, over uh, the culture of consumption versus the culture of stewardship. I, uh, I had dinner in, um, in uh, Italy with, a, uh, with an uh, uh, economics advisor, a, uh, an investment advisor, um, and his, uh, his wife and his three daughters, who are about 18, 19, 20 years old. And uh, 
uh, towards the end of the dinner, he was very interested in his thesis. Uh, he goes to Davos every year and so on. He said, gee, that sounds like kind of thesis that maybe people should know about. But he said, what difference does it make to me? And I said, well, if in terms of your investments, I said, if your three daughters here, if they really decide that the culture of stewardship is their culture and not the culture of consumption, then there's going to be an immediate effect on your, uh, you know, on your, uh, your investments in, in retail, let alone in the, on the manufacturing that leads to those retail products. And he was saying, hmm, yeah, I can see that. But he really hardly needed to because the three daughters were all nodding very enthusiastically that, yes, they really bought the culture of stewardship. They did not want to have to do with the culture of consumption. And I could not get a word in edgewise for the rest of the dinner because they, that's all they wanted to talk about. So that's, that's what's happening right now. But it leads, of course, to a culture of anxiety. And that, of course, has really been focused on nuclear energy particularly, especially, of course, beginning in 1945, then, then in the 50s when nuclear energy in peaceful uses is brought into play, then the culture of anxiety stays with it. That is the culture, that is the culture of nuclear, nuclear energy. So here's just to give a few examples. Um, playwrights, uh, for example. Um, has anybody noticed how much of Chekhov is all about work? He's always talking about work. And the beautiful thing, you know, the end of Uncle Vanya, you know, the end of Uncle Vanya says, you know, we must work. We must work, Uncle. That's all, that's all that Sonia can offer, you know. And it's often humorous. It's often, it's often ludicrous, um, you know, uh, people saying, well, we, we, we must work. You know, it's typically young students and so on in, uh, in uh, the... Uh, the seagull and uh, cherry orchard, uh, you know, the young students are always expostulating, oh, we must work, we must work, but they don't actually do any work themselves. Yeah? Um, that's that kind of uh, character Chekhov is often making fun of, but what he understands is that the, uh, the culture that, of course, came uh, with, uh, with coal, and of course Russia in his time is deeply involved with industrialization, the industrial revolution is going on, and so the values of work, of course, are critical in Chekhov. More obvious is something like Arthur Miller, Death of a Salesman, the impact of the culture of production uh, on the individual, what happens to Willie Lohman uh, and his struggle to, to be a man. What does it mean to be a man is really what uh, Death of a Salesman is about. And, and it's what it is to be a man inside the culture of production and uh, what's, uh, what's uh, uh, happening to us. Transformation culture with electrification, of course. Very many spokesmen, Ibsen, Shaw, Brecht. Uh, you, you pick your other favorites. Uh, plenty of those. The culture of consumption, uh, Tennessee Williams. Uh, Edward Albee, uh, a couple of my favorites, uh, but there, there are many, many others. Um, in the visual arts, it's, um, it's uh, Warhol, you know? uh, the genius, really, of, of, of the incoming of the culture of consumption. Uh, he gets, uh, today we have somebody like Jeff Koons, who's dealing with the culture of consumption as a received value. Everybody knows we're all consumers, aren't we? You know, it's a, it's a received idea now, but it was new in the, in the early 60s when the Russian youth were first saying, gee, we really want to buy Levi's. We don't just want jeans, we want Levi's. We want that brand, uh, right? And when uh, we are getting uh, universal credit and, and so on. So that, the, all those values come about with the culture of consumption. And then, of course, the culture of anxiety, uh, uh, Sartre, Ionesco, uh, the uh, theater of the absurd, uh, many very good examples there. Turning to music, uh, just a nice, uh, a nice kind of uh, uh, contrast between the the um, the uh, culture of um, of uh, production uh, that led to, of course, work songs, uh, blues, jazz. Uh, and folk music and, uh, and uh, acoustic guitars. And then you have, of course, electrification uh, with its culture of transformation and the electric guitar uh, leading to rhythm of blues, rock and roll, and country music. 
That's not to say, you see, that transformation, we think of it as, you know, very often in the political field as involved with, uh, you know, with socialism or, or fascism, which is equally a culture of transformation. Uh, it, it believed that it was possible to change the world in, in, its, uh, in its radical way. Um, but uh, transformation is what it means to, to, uh, to you, to, to your own, uh, to your own uh, 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 social group, your own, uh, your own cultural group, whatever. Uh, these things, by the way, are all very experimental. And if some of you are thinking, mm, I would put it a different way, fine. You know, it's, it's very, very interesting to try to work these things out. Where does, where does the cultural production with coal uh, leave off and where does transformation take over? But one of the transformation points, one of the interesting points is, uh, I've just got it in a small line down there, Dylan at Newport in 1965, the famous uh, moment when Dylan comes out with electric guitars uh, and is electrified. Um, is, uh, the, this is, of course, a week when uh, uh, Pete Seeger, the greatest, uh, the greatest uh, uh, proponent of, uh, certainly of, of, of a real cultural transformation, uh, died this week. And uh, as a result, they've been playing uh, interviews with him. Very, very interesting because um, uh, one of his interviews, uh, he makes very clear that uh, at 65, you know, the, at, at this item in, in 1965, which is the moment, remember, when oil and gas are taking over from coal. It's quite interesting that it happens at that moment. And, and Dylan changes the whole focus. Uh, Seeger was, uh, was accused of having tried to uh, actually, somebody said that he was, he, he, some people even said that he had an ax, which of course he did not, or he was asking for an ax so that he could chop the cables uh, when uh, Dylan was playing electrical. This is absolute mythology, and Seeger made it very clear in an interview towards the end of his life a few years ago, he pointed out, no, uh, he's often played himself with, with musicians with electrical instruments. He doesn't play them himself, but he's quite happy to, to play with others who did. Uh, and he was by no means opposed to what Dylan was doing. His problem was that the sound system was extremely poor. And as a result, you could not hear Dylan's lyrics, <clears throat> which he felt were extremely important. And he went back um, to the um, to the, uh, the techies there saying, you know, that they had to improve the sound system. And <clears throat> apparently, the, uh, whoever was in charge of the technical side shrugged his shoulders and said, this is the way they want it. And, uh, and they wouldn't pay any attention to Seeger. That's why he got mad and said, look, give me, a, give me an ax and I'll chop the cable because he was so frustrated because he was unable to do that. So that's just an interesting little historical item to, to uh, clear up. But what was really happening when Dylan made the change? What was it all about? Um, very, very many accounts of that, of that event it, at Newport in 65 uh, believe that it was, what was about was, of course, the movement from acoustic to electric. That physically, that seemed to be the case. But in fact, what was really happening was that, of course, Dylan, in his previous work, had been part of the culture of transformation. He was singing songs of, of, of social uh, relevance, um, uh, you know, the blowing in the wind and, uh, and um, uh, the times they are a-changing. That, the, that was the culture of transformation. And what he was doing with the new music, of course, was the culture of consumption. And that's what he has stayed with ever since. And it's great. It, one, one of the really significant significant uh, things about all cultural studies one has to you know uh, remain very very clear about is that every culture always has its masterworks every single culture whether you like it or not you may not care for that particular culture it doesn't matter it has its masterworks and so we've had masterworks of the culture of transformation uh, and Dylan went on Dylan did masterworks in both the culture of transformation, and after 65, uh, after the electrification, he, uh, of course, went on to masterworks in the culture of consumption. So that's, uh, I think that's the correct understanding of what was happening at Newport in 65. So the general lesson here is that energy transformation is an engine of cultural change. Mainstream artists celebrate the cultures of dominant energy sources, which today means oil and gas, culture of consumption. Um, since the, uh, since the early or mid-60s. Um, and until recently, its culture was widely accepted. 
I have to tell you, having been there 40 or 50 years ago, nobody would have had any trouble whatsoever with statements that somebody like uh, David Buckland would find absolutely outrageous today which is that, you know, obviously the technology will take care of it. Don't bother me with whatever those problems are. You know, a, a future of unending abundance of, uh, of, of, uh, of uh, uh, plenty of, uh, plenty of uh, uh, resources to, uh, to, to expend and, and plenty of, uh, of uh, uh, products to, to distribute, not just the mass production of the coal era, but rather the the, the, the new era of the culture of consumption, this is absolutely unchallenged. I mean, the number of people who challenged it was, were really countable on one, on one handful, and they did not have much of a, much of a, uh, of, of, of a, of a platform. Whereas today, we have cutting-edge artists uh, advancing the cultural sources, the cultural values associated with the incoming new source of energy, which is uh, uh, renewable energy still very much struggling, but struggling to bring in the culture of stewardship. So the present situation, um, oil and gas still dominant, culture of consumption still dominant, but uh, culture of anxiety due to three centuries of energy transition and cultural change, um, the uh, first energy source since fire to come to us as a weapon, nuclear uh, energy is still very, very present with the culture of anxiety, and we have plenty of that. I think we, we heard some of that uh, earlier today. Um, but renewable energy is driving the true alternative culture of stewardship. The extent of that revolution is really important to grasp. Energy without fuel. Now, I know there's biofuel and there are some other you know, fuel-based uh, alternatives of renewable energy, but the most important part about energy, energy in re renewable energy is that we, for the first time, we've got the possibility of mere technology, technology such as solar panels and wind turbines. We have mere technology can actually uh, give us the energy we need. Uh, we don't have to be dependent on fuel. We'll still be dependent on our energy source, but it will not be on fuel, and that's extremely important in itself. Secondly, that every building, every home can be a producer as well as a consumer of energy. Great news, changes your personal relationship with energy, with the energy that, that you're getting. The possibility that if you have even a little fragment of real estate, even if you're living in a condo tower, you can get solar panels on top of that tower and your, your condo corporation can participate in the production as well as the consumption of, um, of, of energy. Um, the Germans, of course, were way ahead of everybody else uh, as early as uh, 2000 in, uh, in getting that going. And uh, as a result, Germany and Denmark are really very much ahead in terms of, uh, in terms of that uh, aspect of uh, renewable energy. But it is, it is, there are two really important revolutionary principles involved there, changing our relationship with, uh, with energy. And uh, very important is that the culture of stewardship is a participatory culture. So you get this culture, as I was saying, uh, of, of people being encouraged to tell us what their likes are, to become followers, uh, and to participate as makers. The maker culture, as it's called these days, is another important aspect of this whole participating culture, participatory culture, choosing and evaluating books, music, films, and programs, and uh, the lovely conclusion of that, couch potatoes become connoisseurs. It's really possible. I mean, that kind of revolutionary change is really possible with the culture of stewardship. Just for a nice comparison, as I said, I won't, I'm not dragging you through the whole history uh, of the earlier uh, energy sources, but look at the, uh, what happened with the uh, sailing ships' use of wind, wind in our sails as, or, as the sails were organized, uh, beginning, of course, in Genoa and Venice uh, in the, uh, in the um, Mediterranean and then extending around the world. Uh, the revolution in uh, the use of wind energy that happened, uh, of course, uh, bringing about uh, the Renaissance. Merchant of Venice, uh, Shakespeare, uh, hangs the whole plot around, although it's called The Merchant of Venice, he's really thinking of it about London, of course, uh, and what he's talking about is the enormous risk 
that Antonio runs by, uh, by uh, investing all of his money in these voyages around the world. And incredibly, of course, for the sake of the plot, all of his voyages uh, uh, come a cropper. Uh, he loses his, uh, loses his investment, and he appears to be penniless, and that's why Shylock is about to collect his uh, pound of flesh. Well, um, as we all know, uh, the, the, the plot ends differently, but, but the reason for the plot, the rationale, is the enormous risk that's involved in, these, in this uh, investment in this uh, new uh, source of energy. Um, which, uh, which begins in the Mediterranean, as I say. Uh, and so a culture of investment is invented to spread the risk. So in the 17th century, the Netherlands and Britain formed the world's first joint stock companies. The, the Dutch East India Company and the British East India Company are the first joint stock companies. And the stock exchange, the Royal Stock Exchange, comes out of that, those developments, right? So the whole business of stock investment and so on that we're all so accustomed to today simply came out of that new energy source at that time. Really very powerful changes in the, in the ways we, uh, we organize the world. Those who took the risks, whether they were investors or, on the other hand, whether they were the captains of ships. I remember actually, incredibly, I do remember actually getting the strap in um, public school because I think it was grade seven or eight, grade eight it was, I think, when the teacher announced that we were going to study the explorers. Well, we had studied the explorers in grade five, six, seven, uh, and I groaned when I heard, oh, God, uh, we're going to hear about all the explorers again. <clears throat> That's why I got the strap. But, <laughs> but, <clears throat> but it sticks in my mind, not only because of the pain of the strap, but because what happened, you see, is that suddenly when we get to the 16th century, we suddenly got all these individuals. We've got Magellan, and we've got Columbus, and we've got, we've got uh, De Soto, and we've got, you know, you name them. Uh, every country suddenly has, you know, the Portuguese, the Spanish, the British, the French, the, uh, the Dutch. Uh, you know, they're all over the place. They're ship captains, you know? They're ship captains. They're the guys who are deciding whether or not this will be successful or not. So watching last night's uh, show about, the, about uh, the, uh, the voyage to the Arctic uh, is kind of reminiscent of that. Um, these are ship captains. That's what we're dealing with there. Um, and that's, those individuals suddenly spring to life. Well, of course, that's simply the economic accompaniment to the uh, Renaissance portraits uh, and the whole focus on the life of the individual. Cervantes, of course, the, the invention of the novel and equally the invention of opera. Um, in, uh, in 1600, in, uh, in Italy, uh, the invention of the opera, which is, again, a narrative. Everything is narratives about individuals. And, of course, Shakespeare, Rembrandt, uh, Moliere, you know, you can, you can uh, make a great long list uh, of all these artists so that what we have with, with wind in our sails, with, with that particular energy transition, we got the culture of investment, yes, but more importantly, we got the culture of individuality, of individualism, in the belief that there's something really valuable in telling the story of an individual's life. Something, again, we take for absolute granted today. It became universal. Nobody questioned it anymore, but it was a brand new idea for the, uh, for the Renaissance and, uh, and the 16th, 17th century. That, I couldn't resist that uh, extra slide of the, uh, one of the Baroque theaters. This is when, uh, shortly after opera was invented, uh, the first theater in Venice is 1637, uh, uh, first dedicated opera theater, and within about 20 years, there were 50 of them in, in Venice. Many of them failed uh, and so on, but there was an enormous growth of, uh, of opera theaters, of course, uh, first in Italy and then throughout the, throughout the world, beginning with theaters like this in Venice. So I thought some of you who design theaters would be uh, charmed to see uh, a Baroque theater. So getting to the end now, um, what is the emerging culture of stewardship? <clears throat> and we have to remember that we are, in, we are in the early stages. That is what is happening right now. This conference is part of the culture of stewardship. And our values are being changed by the incoming values of renewable energy. It isn't any stronger than it is because renewable energy is being held back by big, big coal and big oil. 
but as it as it uh, gets stronger, it will it will change. I think one of the first uh, uh, illustrations, particularly for those of you from Europe, will recognize Arte Povera, the idea of making great works of art out of crap, out of garbage, out of out of materials that were discarded, out of materials that nobody would really look at. That idea uh, of Arte Povera is, I think, the beginning of possibility of looking at salvage, of <clears throat> maybe there's something we can save out of this. Dario Fo's theater cooperatives in Italy, the Teatro del Narazione, uh, again in the, uh, that's in the 60s, uh, in Milan and uh, Bologna, um, uh, very interesting uh, applications because, of course, it was, it was uh, participatory, uh, as probably some of you know very well. Um, uh, he was working right off of uh, today's newspapers, uh, and of course, he and his wife both got into terrible trouble uh, with the authorities because they were they were doing uh, satirical theater uh, based on tonight's newspaper, and uh, and uh, always you know improvising, but with lots of participation from the audience. So that's I think was again feeling towards this culture of stewardship as it's emerging. Earth art, we have of course the. Uh, the great um, uh, spiral jetty uh, in, uh, in uh, that's the spiral jetty in um, the Great Salt Lake. Um, uh, stewardship of the planet uh, in every form of earth art uh, is now uh, a, very, a very familiar phenomenon to us in many of the world's galleries and museums. Uh, but I think equally uh, interesting is performance art, um, uh, as it's called, not performing arts now, but performance art, which is to say stewardship of the body. If we can't be stewards of the whole earth, let's at least be stewards of our body. Or the stewardship of the earth starts with stewardship of your own body. Um, and interestingly enough, this is, of course, Marina Abramovich uh, with uh, her great production just a couple of years ago at the Museum of Modern Art uh, called the artist, is, the artist is Present. And the only thing there was that she sat on that chair for uh, about 10 hours a day uh, giving a 10-minute 10 minute uh, uh, audiences with each member of the audience who wanted to come and sit in front of her. No, no speech, no, no talk, simply looking at each other, looking into each other's eyes and people were breaking down crying and uh, having uh, just enormous emotional relationships sitting there for 10 minutes with, uh, with uh, Marino. Um, so that's the presence of the body. Marina, of course, famous for having done things like cutting a cross in her chest uh, earlier and things like that, which violated the body, but it's precisely the violation is precisely to draw attention to the question of stewardship of the body. So uh, I think that performance art, stewardship of the body is one of the really critical, one of the really cr critical factors. And a, a, a less, a less uh, 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 major but certainly very widespread phenomenon is the gym replaces the bar. For those of us who have to do a lot of work on the road, uh, uh, going to consult with uh, theaters and museums and so on all around the world, um, we know that uh, I go back far enough that I can remember the day when everybody would gather in the bar after uh, after a day's work or after you know after after the meeting, you went to the bar, right? Nobody does that anymore. You go to the bar, you go on your own. <laughs> no, no, what, where everybody is at is at the gym. Uh, very often early in the morning. So you can't have a breakfast meeting until everybody has done their thing in the gym, right? Uh, so the gym replacing the bar is part of that culture of stewardship of the body, uh, which, is, uh, which comes along uh, alongside of uh, things like performance art. Uh, and finally, a couple of very current examples. Uh, Bjork's uh, Biophilia album, the first album with participatory apps. Um, uh, a very interesting phenomenon, and of course she is very strongly associated with the environmentalist movement and with, uh, you know, with the whole culture that renewable energy is bringing about. Uh, and of course Neil Young, uh, very, very recently, linking uh, the environmental issues to, of course, the, uh, the rights of the native people uh, and, their, and their disrespected treaties uh, in relation to um, the uh, Alberta oil sands and the, that whole uh, crisis. Uh, uh, Neil Young making that very strong, very strong uh, statement, uh, really associating the arts very strongly with that aspect of the culture of, uh, of stewardship. So that's uh, that's the thesis. Uh, I see that I've, I've, uh, 
done exactly, uh, come, come exactly on to one o'clock, um, and uh, Ian probably wants me to get off the stage here. Um, do we have time for a couple questions or no? Okay, if we, if we can deal with them quickly, I'll try to uh, deal with the little question. But it's, anyway, it's an exciting thesis. The book comes out in May. Uh, uh, it'll be, be out with AAM Press. But um, I, think it's, I think it's important to you because you are really exemplifying right here, you're making history right now as part of the culture of stewardship. And so it's, I think it's valuable for you to see yourself in relation to that uh, it will get stronger as renewable energy uh, gets stronger. And eventually renewable energy takes over, everybody will accept these ideas as being absolutely obvious. Right? But today, it's still a big struggle uh, with the received ideas that go with the other energy sources. Yes? You're going to have to say that louder. I couldn't catch it. Do you think that stewardship can actually uh, be a way to transform human welfare? Uh, well, y yes. I, I, the thing is that, yes, but it's not, it's not really so much a moral question that as really an historical one. It depends on, the, on our ability to really get the support behind renewable energy, uh, which could be done far more than it is. It's actually being resisted in very clever ways by big oil at the moment. Uh, so big oil is remaining in a very prominent position. Uh, and therefore, the culture of consumption is all around us. Uh, but I, the, I think what's interesting is we live in an age, again, of energy transition. So as renewable energy is coming on, we're getting more and more discussion of these things. Uh, you can start a fight in almost any cocktail party just by saying renewable energy uh, these days. Um, and that's, that's a, a good sign. Um, there will have to be greater strength to uh, renewable energy, and there can be. At the present time, I'm afraid, renewable energy accounts for only about 1% of the world's energy sources, you know, generally. And so despite all of our excitement about it and all our, uh, all our involvement in it, it's, it's still, uh, you know, in its infancy. So as it gains strength, you will have more and more of the culture of stewardship replacing it. As I said, when I was talking to this chap in, uh, in Italy, this investment manager, all three of his daughters were saying, yes, that's what we want. You know? So that, that's what is happening right now. And what the, I mean, I'm very encouraged to see this much interest from you all in all the questions of sustainability. Uh, haven't gotten into here huh, the bigger question of... Uh, what is the motor of uh, culture of stewardship and particularly of sustainable energy? It depends on storage. We have to be able to store the sun's energy so we can use it at night. We have to be able to store the wind's energy so we can use it when we need it, right? Storage of energy uh, brings us to a database. What is data? What is digitization? This is where I say digitization was part of electrification, but it's also about data, about the, about, uh, the importance of, of data. Uh, data are congealed energy. It, data is simply stored energy. Hackers are breaking into the energy base. They are breaking into that, that source. That is why, I've always been very puzzled by this, why do hackers have such terrible penalties? Why are, they, why, are they, why are they taken so seriously? I mean, after all, you could say, well, okay, it's inconvenient for hackers to get in the way of our systems and so on, but big deal. No, no, no. It's extremely important to, uh, to the people who control these things to protect themselves against hackers and therefore to impose very serious penalties against them. Read the Middle Ages when uh, firewood and charcoal made from firewood were the main energy source. All you hear about is about peasants, the terrible penalties, and they really were gruesome, the terrible penalties that were visited on peasants for chopping down the wood on their master's, uh, on their master's uh, forests. Yeah? Exactly the same thing as what hackers are doing today. Yeah? So that's, the, that's, that's really where we're at right now in, in, this, uh, in this struggle. Okay, Ian, I guess I should hand over to you. Oh, sorry. Did you have a question there? Yeah. 
Oh, well, I mean, you know, I mean, there's, there's a huge number of, of um, you know, uh, uh, the, uh, I think earth artists are a whole, you know, a whole group of themselves. Um, I, I think there's a great deal of dance that's being, you know, that's being formed around these ideas of, uh, of, of stewardship, uh, that sort of thing. Uh, we saw last night, we saw, you know, one uh, effort in that direction. Um, and, uh, you know, I think there's a lot of, uh, you know, music and dance that is, you know, that is forming around those things. But this is early, early innings yet. You know, when you look at something like, for example, the revolution of wind, wind energy, how powerful it was to create, you know, the stock exchange on the one hand, and on the other hand, to create, you know, uh, a, a situation where somebody like a Shakespeare and a Rembrandt could take the ideas of individuality and make them into great art forms. That's, you know, we're, we're in the early stages of it. But certainly, I think it's, uh, it's going to come uh, more and more. Ian, I should hand over to you because we, I think we need to get on the agenda.